a second breakfast in the display garden of the Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research in Cologne. Today's topic is wheat, so there are fresh rolls to get in the mood for it. Boosted with energy, the pupils of the Otto Hahn Secondary School are climbing Monte Kochi too, to get a good view of the neighboring grain fields. Wheat is one of the most important staple foods worldwide. With an annual yield of 650 million tons, wheat comes third after maize and rice. Wolfgang Schuchert of the Science Bahn has a lot to say about the long way from an ancient wild grass to what is modern wheat today. The genetic material of today's wheat is actually a composition of the genetic material from three wild species that you can see here. Wheat originates from the wild grass einkorn wheat, which provided food for the people of the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East, between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, as long ago as 10,000 years ago. Scientists of the Max Planck Institute managed to find out where exactly the cradle of our modern wheat is, by using DNA analyses. It was located at the foot of the Karachadag mountain in southeast Turkey. The name Einkorn means that it has a two-row seed head with single grains left and right of the panicle. However, wild grasses like Einkorn also had properties that made them less favorable for human usage. You can quite clearly see it here when you look at this ripe ear. Go on, give it a try. Try bending it slightly. Do you notice anything? Yes, it snaps rather easily. And they shatter the grains. Occasionally there were some plants that didn't shatter their grains so easily because they carried a mutation. And those were the plants that were interesting for people. They made it possible for the farmer to harvest the whole ear using a sickle, and he didn't need to collect all the grains off the ground any longer. This is how wild einkorn was domesticated. People selected the plants they grew and started to settle. This transition from a wild grass to a crop plant is termed the Neolithic Revolution because of its enormous social significance. Agriculture started off in this region and then spread along the Mediterranean to Central Europe and other places. On the way to modern wheat, another wild grass played an important role, Agelops speltoides. A hybrid of this grass with einkorn created wild emma. By deliberately selecting plants, people turned wild into domesticated emma. Domesticated emma gave rise to today's durum wheat, which only accounts for 10% of the entire wheat production. What is it used for today? Durum wheat is the preferred choice for pasta products like spaghetti or macaroni. Bread wheat or baking wheat, on the other hand, has got very good baking qualities. In order to create today's most commonly used bread wheat or common wheat, a third wild grass came into play. A hybrid of domesticated emma with a wild grass called jointed goat grass first gave us spelt and subsequently our modern soft wheat varieties. In the course of the domestication and cultivation of these grasses, further properties improved. And what does free threshing mean? Well, if you take an ear of grain like this, each seed is enveloped in a husk. Now, in wild grasses, these husks usually adhere very strongly to the grain. In cultivated cereals, however, like in cultivated wheat, they're only very loosely connected to the grain, which is, of course, a great advantage when it comes to grinding the grains. You don't want any chaff in your flour. Another revolution kicked in, beginning in the 1940s, the so-called Green Revolution. Up to that time, the long stalks of the wheat plants were a great disadvantage for their cultivation. Entire yields were destroyed because of lodging. The agricultural scientist Norman Borlaug managed to breed wheat varieties with shorter stalks that were nevertheless able to support large and productive ears. Due to the Green Revolution, wheat yields increased many times over during a short period of time and significantly improved the global food situation. 
That's how in countries like India, local agriculture came to produce enough wheat to meet local demands. Certain disadvantages of these wheat varieties arose from their need for intensive fertilization and the large amounts of pesticides they were treated with, which then caused environmental problems. To finish with, the pupils are given an insight into the daily routine of modern cereal breeding. Sigrid Efkin demonstrates how a hybridization of barley plants is carried out. The anthers of the flower are removed when the pollen is not yet ripe. Why did you remove them all? The thing is that the ear will later be put in a small bag, and if a single anther remained inside it, a self-pollination would probably occur. This would happen because cereals are self-pollinating plants, and if it pollinated itself, we wouldn't get a hybrid. But we want a deliberate cross-breeding. The years of the breeding partner are selected. And then you remove the anthers from here, like we did a moment ago, and put them in this empty flower. Finally, the pupils themselves get to go at using the scissors and the forceps. And what are the properties that breeders want to improve nowadays? The main aims of cereal breeding are still today to increase yields and improve qualitative aspects. For wheat, the baking quality plays a major role, but drought resistance and hardiness in difficult climatic conditions are of growing importance.